Have you all been having a good time, praise God? Well, we are excited to bring forth the head shepherd of this house, our very dear one, William Lamar the Fourth. Ivy, here he is. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Metropolitan African Methodist Episcopal Church. It's a joy to welcome you to this place. And Sister Lucy is one of my heroes. Give it up for Sister Lucy again. Short man. And I want to thank Reverend Patty Fears as well for just her extraordinary spirit. And I want you to take some time with me to just be present. To breathe. To inhale possibility. And exhale fear. to inhale revolution and exhale the status quo. Now two things I want to lift. First, uh, one of my teachers taught us that as the world spins, it is important to be always aware that there is terra firma beneath our feet even now. So would you take a moment to just, if you're able, to place some energy in your feet and kind of press down on the floor and know that even as the world spins, we are grounded. And to make the connection that the poets whose imaginings are captured in many of our sacred texts remind us that we were made from the dust of the ground. To be in contact with the dust of the ground is to be in contact with ourselves. And to also be reminded, as one of my other teachers, Mama Itihari, teaches us that this place is an ancestral shrine. And so here in Metropolitan, you experience the presences of those who have done the work that we do in our day, in past days. So I want to bring to your attention that from the pulpit upstairs, and those of you, some of you may not have had a chance to go upstairs, but that Frederick Douglass delivered one of his last orations from the pulpit upstairs called Lessons for the Hour. He delivered that in February of 1894. He was deceased. He became an ancestor in January of 1895. That from this pulpit, Booker T. Washington spoke. W.E.B. Du Bois spoke. Mary McLeod Bethune spoke that so many who had visions for a nation beyond the strictures of a white supremacist settler colonial reality cast that vision from this space and that we are all a part of an extension of that. And I wanna thank you for gathering here and being a part of that broader legacy. Now, Metropolitan is the oldest continuously occupied parcel of property by persons of African descent in the capital of the American empire. Unbroken black ownership of this parcel of property since the 1880s. And I want you to put your hands together for that because it is an extraordinary feat, and there are members of the congregation here who make that happen. I want you to put your hands up, those who are members of our congregation. I see you, and I'm glad uh, to serve alongside you. Now, what I share with people is when you walk up on this space, you can see and you can feel that this is somewhat of a place that seems out of time because around us are towering buildings and parking garages, but this space has looked as it looks from the outside since the 1880s. And what's important to note 
One of my teachers taught me this and my brain expanded and I felt like my head exploded. And that is that rhetoric consists not just in words, but every symbol designed to communicate is rhetorical. Therefore, the way we dress is rhetoric. Architecture is rhetoric. The way you style your hair is rhetoric. What jewelry you wear or choose not to wear, all rhetoric, all sign, all symbol communicating. And this grand space erected in the 1880s tells you all you need to know about those who dreamed of building this church. And that is they had grand visions of who they were, who their progeny would become, and who their God was. And they intentionally placed this church just six blocks or seven blocks from the executive mansion known as the White House because they knew that the theology of the American empire was totally in opposition to their own theology. They wanted to create a space with an affirmative theological message that every human being is made in the image of the divine and that no human being is to be excluded from flourishing and from the abundance that is ours to share. So I tell people the difference between Metropolitan and the National Cathedral is the National Cathedral was not founded for all people. This space from its beginning was founded for us all. So you are at home because the ancestors who dreamt of this space dreamt of a space of welcome for every human being. And finally, hopefully you'll get a chance to go upstairs, that this space was funded by many persons who had been formerly enslaved, who had a dream, again, of a national gathering space. And this, at one point, was the largest auditorium space controlled by black people. So school from here, Howard University graduations would be held here, lyceums and uh, uh, all forms of, of speeches and lectures would happen here. And so I want to, to share that with you. Just a few more things, because we've been at work all day. I don't normally dress like this on Saturdays, please forgive me, but had a funeral and a lot of things going on today. There are a few things that have to happen, I believe, for us to pierce America's love affair with guns and America's racial caste system violence against persons who are non-desirables for many reasons, the color of their skin, who they may love, their religious affiliation. And I want to lift up a book that I, I, if I had more time, I'd say more about it. But this book is entitled Myths America Lives By. Myths America Lives By by Richard Hughes. And there is a new edition. The new edition is subtitled White Supremacy and the Stories That Give Us Meaning. And what I want to lift up here very quickly, some years ago when I was working elsewhere, we brought in uh, someone who told us that um, cultural anthropo, no, I'm gonna, let me just, you know that the human species is called homo sapiens, which refers to our ability to make tools. You all familiar with that? But we do know now that some of our ape cousins also make tools. So we don't have exclusive rights to homo sapiens now. But what this person did share is that we are homo narens. He calls our species homo narens. That would be we are made who we are as a species because we tell stories. What makes us who we are as humans, storytelling. If you've ever been around children, they ask for what? Stories. And if you pay a Netflix subscription, you are asking for stories. If you listen to music, you are asking for stories. And so we are held together in this nation by myths. Now a myth is not a lie, because I would hold for you that the majority of stories in our sacred books are myths. Does that mean that they are, not, that they are lies? What that means is that they are stories that give us meaning, that we have decided we can order our lives by. And here are five myths that America orders its violence around. One, that America is a chosen nation. That is a myth. Two, that America is nature's nation. Now, a lot of these are, are interrelated, but nature's nation ultimately means that America sees itself as the ultimate nation state, that as you evolve intellectually, spiritually, economically, the best you can come up with is America. If America is the best that we can come, in, come up with, then the human imagination is most poor. 
If we can't do better than this, we are in trouble. Are you listening to me? If America is the best that human beings can do, we are in trouble with a capital T. That America is a Christian nation. That is a damn lie. Malcolm X once said that uh, you can sleep in a garage, but that, make, that doesn't make you a Buick. And so America calling itself Christian does not make it Christian. If you know anything about the revolutionary life of the Christ, he was no American and would have very little good to say about our economics, our politics, the way we treat one another, and the way we treat the earth. So it is a myth. Whenever you see somebody like me, ordained preacher, telling you that America is a Christian nation, you tell them you met a preacher in D.C. who said that's a damn lie. I'll skip one, and also innocent nation, that America is an innocent nation. America is not innocent. And what America has taught us is that any blood shed by America is expiated because America is doing the spilling. Because America has a divine calling and that America is morally superior to other nations. So America would say that we are forgiven of what happened to the natives who were here. What happened to Africans here? What happened to women here? What happens to Muslims here? What happens to gay people here? That America is an innocent nation, and when we shed blood, it is inevitably in the service of liberty. That also is a lie, and the reason that lie continues is because people like me tell you that America can do whatever America wants to do, and this is not true. And I come from the perspective of Genesis where the divine one says to the one brother who killed the other brother, where is your brother? And he said, am I my brother's keeper? And the divine one said, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. That if there is a divine, divine one hears always the blood that we have shed and the divine one does not cease hearing because America is doing the spilling. And so to puncture this, we've got to reckon with these myths and we've got to stop letting preachers, politicians, academics, journalists tell us these lies because we all know better. And then my sister, where are you that talked about um, waging peace? Are you still here? Thank you. You mentioned Walter Wink. If you have not read Walter Wink, Walter Wink has an idea, the myth of redemptive violence. And I want to give that to you. Have y'all already talked about that today? I'll give it to you very briefly. America's entertainments, all of them, every Marvel movie, every Gunsmoke episode, every Star Trek episode, they are all built on the myth of redemptive violence. Americans believe in redemptive violence to the very core of American being. And that is that you can get to peace through killing. So at the end of every Gunsmoke episode, either Chester and Marshall Dillon or Festus and Marshall Dillon are killing some bad guys. And then they ride off. Some of y'all are too young. You don't know this. Then they ride away and all is at peace in Dodge City. We do know that you can never get to peace through violence. That every Marvel movie shows some person killing all the bad guys and then all is well in Gotham, all is well in Metropolis. It is not well. It is because philosophers on the other side say that war will never bring peace because the dead men have sons and the dead women have daughters and they will continue to avenge. We have never been serious about peace because war and violence fuel our economy. So we don't think about when we read scripture in the Christian tradition is the reason that Jesus had to heal people is because the Roman Empire grew fatter, wealthier, more powerful through people's sickness, poverty, and hunger. The miracles were interruptions of an imperial economic reality. Miracles were interruptions of an economic imperial reality. The divine saying, I do not intend sickness, 
see this healing, see another way. And you do know they decided to kill Jesus precisely at the moment that he raised Lazarus from the dead. If you read John's gospel, because the powers that controlled Rome and controlled America, their power is based on death. So when you land in DCA, you will see towering buildings in Virginia. These are the death industrial complex buildings. Raytheon, McDonnell Douglas. That is blood and death. And they have convinced us that we have to feed them in order to stay safe. When indeed there is another way. Finally, let me say this. That is that... Um, I never knew how related guns, race, and America's love affair with killing were until I read some of the work of a scholar and journalist by the name of Elaine Stevens, or a reporter from The Trace. Now, I'm a lot of things, but I'm not a plagiarist. And so I want to give this, act, this intellectual credit to, to Elaine St Stevens, A-L-A-I-N. I want y'all to look it up, read more. But I never realized how intertwined race and guns were enslavement and guns were. So the introduction of firearms influences the transatlantic slave trade. In the 16th and 17th centuries, firearms were developed and stayed in Europe. One, the Catholic Church prohibited the sale of firearms to, to non-Catholics. Now, isn't that beautifully Christian? We keep the guns, all right? And then firearms did not work well in tropical climates. How many of you have ever heard that saying, keep your powder dry, right? Because when the powder is wet, it, 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 won't, it, won't, uh, it won't explode. It won't, it won't take, a, take a charge. And also the way that these guns were built, they would rot and warp in tropical climates. So the Protestants come along, they have flintlock muskets, and that begins to allow the trade in human flesh to explain. Because three Europeans with flintlock muskets could take hundreds of Africans. And what you will notice if you read the ledgers of trade, that they were traded for firearms. And over time, as the firearms became more valuable, the human beings became more valuable. And that America, even with the Second Amendment coming uh, into America, those militias, as my, as my brother here mentioned, they in the South existed to regulate the movement of black people, such that in South Carolina, they passed a law that all white men had to carry firearms or they could be arrested or charged and have to pay a fee because they were afraid of the revolutionary activity that happened both in America all the time. You don't read about all of the rebellions, Stono, New Orleans, and also what was going on in Haiti, all of these revolutionary movements. And so the, the love affair with the gun is tied in with the logics of race and control of space and people. The last thing I will say is we can do the hard work of imagining something different and telling another story that will impact our economics, that will impact our politics, that will impact our theology. And that begins now with a story that is beyond the myth of redemptive violence, a story that says that in this world created by the Holy One, there is enough for us all to flourish and to live together peaceably. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your good work. I just want to apologize for saying a bad word as a preacher. I'm so sorry. <laughs>